Ken Mag Magnuson, welcome to Unitarian Anabaptist. Well, it's good to be here, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for coming on. Yes. So you have seen some of my interviews, and you were very encouraging, complimenting uh, the work that I'm doing, and that was very, very helpful to me. And it looks like you have some things that you could add to my content as well. Well, I guess we could get into that, but I have okay. enjoyed very much your uh, all your guests, and uh, I mean, it's good to to meet our fellow brothers and sisters. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Okay, I am Kim Magnuson, and I'm a retired uh, ship captain, and uh, I've been married since 1970. So. Um, coming up on, well, 54 years, wow. and, uh, okay. and we have three children, and they're spread all over the U.S., one in Oregon, one in Alabama, and one in um, Vermont, but we moved out here to Hawaii from Oregon in uh, 1998, and uh, have been out here ever since, and um, We'll probably stay here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so your background is one, like your background is from the Lutheran church. That's right. where, that's how you were raised as a Lutheran. So wh what is it to be raised a Lutheran? Like, can you describe what a, how a Lutheran believes, how a Luth Lutheran thinks with respect well, to the Lutheran, faith? Mm -hmm. The Lutheran Church was, you know, a spin-off of the Catholic Church at the Reformation period with Martin Luther, and um, it's a liturgical church. So there is a time for confession. There's a time for the Eucharist. There's a time um, for prayer, singing. It's very regimented. And okay. so they have a, a Old Testament lesson period, a psalmody, and then a New Testament. And then a pastor usually gives the sermon at that point. And then you'll have communion afterwards. And um, because that was essentially all I knew for years, it wasn't until my horizons opened up and I went to other places that I began to see that there were Pentecostal people and there were Baptists and uh, and I was sort of ecumenical in, in just the way I thought. I wondered why these denominations tended to put a, um, a rope around themselves and, and not tend to um, to see how other believers believed and okay. um, worshipped. Yes. So, so what is what is confession like in the Lutheran Church? Is it similar to a Catholic Church? Well, I I haven't been to the Catholic confession, so I really don't okay. know. But it's a time where some of the pastors have the option of just giving a time period to reflect on your sinful nature and, and repent, okay. which is Luther was a very strong re uh, person that really said we needed to repent every day and often. Okay. okay. Um, and so it's it's usually a short one. Sometimes it's just written in the hymnal and it's read. And I always had to hit myself for vain repetition, <laughs> remembering that we're not supposed to have that. So okay, okay, <laughs> okay. All right. So, what? How did your journey lead from from this background going forward, as far as understanding the the basics of gospel messaging? Well, I really wasn't into the gospel of the kingdom. It was more. I was raised the gospel was uh, just like John 3.16, that 
God so loved the world that he sent his son. And believing in this, you could receive eternal life. And okay. um, I mean, it was okay. Uh, I thought there was a little more to it. And um, we did attend other places even at the same time. So I got a little sprinkling from the Pentecostals uh, of a little different way of worship and that, but it actually seemed that other than not being as liturgical, there was a lot of similarity. They were singing praise songs, although more modern praise songs and okay. instead of ones from the 1600s. Okay, okay. A mighty fortress is our God. Ah, huh? that's it. <laughs> okay. You're almost so, there. Yes, yes. So can you just, like, as far as the gospel of believing in Jesus, what was it that you were supposed to believe about Jesus in order to be saved? Well, in order to be saved, that's interesting. Um, or was that kind of language used? Well, they don't stress so much. Um, like some of the Baptists and some of the other evangelicals, they'll tell you the date they were saved. They uh -huh. remember that. They don't. Lutherans really don't talk about that too much. They they okay. believe that that your belief turns into salvation. You should be baptized. I always thought that the baptism of infants and stuff seemed a little odd to me, but they are like Catholics and some others that baptize infants. Okay. And although I was baptized as a seven year old, not quite an infant, I again got baptized as an adult. Yes, yes. Uh, within the Lutheran Church or? No, no. Within okay. a covenant church. Okay. So when did you decide that you had to move on from the Lutheran environment? Well, um, I had some theological issues with the infant baptism and also in the Eucharist. I was never a, um, a believer that Jesus's actual body and blood oh are being consumed and that is the difference between catholic and lutheran with transubstantiation and consubstantiation one of them the catholics believed if, as the um, priest blessed the elements they actually became the body and blood okay. of jesus at that point and wow. lutherans believed in in consubstantiation where upon consuming oh, wow. the elements that they're blessed but then upon consumption you receive and i had some difficulty with that uh, i um from a so theological they think that this, okay they think that this actually literally becomes the blood and the body of jesus once you consume them yeah as you as you're consuming it you're actually wow. consuming and it's um I mean, part of it that seemed a little odd to me was I was raised that Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient. And that, okay. and that if you need to do this all the time and eat more and do it, then maybe it wasn't enough. Okay. <laughs> you're, having, okay. you're having to add to it if that's... Uh, and between that and I never was a, uh, I was told when I was young and, and as I continued in the Lutheran faith about the Trinity, and I always thought there was something extremely suspicious about it huh. to me. Uh, it okay. just, I never could wrap my, my head around this Godhead. And I think 
a lot of pastors like to say, well, it's a mystery. And, you know, it, using the word mystery, you can pretty much cover everything. Yes. Um, uh, but I, I always, from just hearing John 3.16, it seemed to me that there's a God and the God sent his son and the son wasn't himself yes. in the form of a person in spite of what anyone else said, I wasn't going to, to um, okay. accept that. So this questioning or doubt you had at a pretty young age, it sounds like. Yeah, I think I almost always was suspicious that, uh -huh. uh, and in all fairness, they really didn't talk about it much. And I've talked to people in other denominations, Baptists, and Assemblies of God and, and stuff. And it seems like an awful lot of people don't think about it much or they... Okay. They just... So you, you did. You did happen to think about it. <laughs> yeah, I thought so... about it. <laughs> okay. And that I never so saw Godhead in the scripture. I never saw Godhead in three persons in a Godhead. And yeah. uh, I, and I also felt when it was stated that, well, all three of these persons are co-equal and co-eternal, that I never quite could, um, could put the thread through the needle and see why, if they were equal, does one pray to the other one? Yeah, right. But the other one never prays back. <laughs> It's always, quite, yeah. Very it, interesting it, observations. Wow. Yeah, it it just seemed to me that uh, that Jesus always had a God. Yes. And that time. I wanted to worship the God that Jesus worships. Mm -hmm. And okay. kind of leave it at that. So, so are there creeds that are stated in a Lutheran assembly? Yes, not every week, although most every week you have the Apostles' Creed. And okay. I'm sure you have probably read it. And I have, yes. I don't have any difficulty really with the Apostles' Creed because it doesn't call Jesus God. And it now if you're getting into Athanasian Creed or um, the Nicene Creed, um, I used to recite them as a Lutheran, but I'm, that's my uh, BC days kind of, you know. That, uh, okay, so let me ask this. So you said that the creeds were read, but not, not on a regular basis. Not the Nicene or the Athanasian Creed. Oh, no, not but those the, two. Not those okay. two. The Apostles' Creed, most every week. Oh. So okay. it's pretty common unless it's a certain time because... The Lutheran Church, like Catholic and Episcopal or Anglican, they keep a, a church year where you have the Advent season and then you you go on into um, Pentecost and you go through uh, Easter and, and the, it's all broken down. Okay, so and it's a repeat every year and this it's service... A repeat. The services are related to the particular topic of the day. Yeah, the to, they're they're really related to the season, you know, the okay. church year. So as you approach Pentecost time, you're gonna get you're gonna get sermons on Pentecost. Okay. And you're going and it won't just be that one Sunday, it will be leading up to it. And the same with Advent will start, I think first of December, and in those churches every week, it will be leading up to the birth of Jesus. Okay. okay, so you had all these questions or doubts in your own mind. And the, the process of coming to grips with the questions you had, how did you come to grips with these questions? Boy, that's that's an interesting one. I 
I would attend Bible studies and ask um, a question about something, you know, or I would just come out and they were pretty forgiving, you know. I, in all fairness, the, um, the people I worshiped with, when I told them, well, you know, I don't do this um, child baptism thing. I'm, I'm really not a believer in it. And I have no problem with people that dedicate a newborn. You know, just like Jesus was dedicated. But I, I'm a believer that baptism is a personal choice. Yes. And uh, a, a two-week-old child <laughs> is not really making any choices. Right, right, right. So you brought this up in the context of a Lutheran Bible study. Oh, yeah. I brought okay. it up. And, and Interesting. you know, they're not going to change. But, but on the other hand, they said, well, it does say in there that um, uh, at one of the uh, places mentioning baptism where somebody in their whole house was baptized. So okay. if you read that, you can say, well, maybe that included babies or in, uh, you know, a lot of times during that period of time with Jews and stuff, People were hardly counted except as adults. They were your spare parts off in the corner, I guess, but yeah. uh, they weren't really given like full uh, rights, I think. Full recognition. Okay. Yeah. So this was going on. This, these conversations were happening within the Lutheran Church. And. Yeah. You were, were you actually in a position to teach or to preach in the Lutheran well, church? Well, one time I was asked um, to, I was asked a couple of times to fill in when the pastor was gone. You know, I mean, they do have vacations or some synodical thing or something. And, and one of them uh, was on Trinity Sunday, which is part of that church calendar. Okay. And uh, I knew that it was going to be kind of odd. And But I knew somebody that uh, was a friends of the family that lives in Canada that was an Anglican priest. And I gave him a call and I go, gosh, I go, I, I have to give the word on Trinity Sunday, you know. And he just oh. laughed and said, oh, he said, well, I'll tell you a little secret in the churches. He said, um, that's the Sunday the pastors like to go on vacation. <laughs> and so they want a relief. They don't want to deal with it, I guess, much. So, you know, I, you, I, in a way, I feel guilty because I used the same old water and steam and, uh, you know, the arguments of, of three elements. Oh. In fact, I think oh. I used... Uh, Neapolitan ice cream. And so oh, really? I said, well, it's all ice cream, but as you see, there's three flavors, but they're all 100% ice cream. And you can make these analogies, um, but I think they're, they're really not, not very valid when you're comparing no. them to a Holy Spirit, a son, no. and a father. Right, right. So at that time, were you, would you say that you were not subscribing to it, but you simply had to fulfill your task? Yeah, I think I just, uh, I tried to make it work. I thought, well, this is what these people, you know, do. And it's not going to convince me much, but I'll tell them maybe what they want to hear. Maybe they can figure out something about it. And, and I didn't really, uh, uh, put a lot of credence into what I had to say. And I thought after talking to my pa pastor friend from the Anglican church that if pastors don't want to do this, these people aren't going to probably, it's just another Sunday at church for them. Yes. Yeah. They're not going to be thinking too hard about this. No, I don't think so. So when, 
how so how, at this point you are a, you consider yourself a unitarian christian and you believe that there is one god that jesus is god's messiah a full-fledged human being and that the spirit of god is what the how would you describe the spirit of well, god well that's that's a good one because i just the holy spirit i probably thought well you know it's I guess it could be considered a person, you know, the way it's spoken about within uh, the church. But I always thought it's kind of strange that this third quote unquote person not only doesn't have a name, but he never speaks. He never, it, he, he just is in you all of a sudden, uh -huh. you know, that if you ask. And so I thought, well, there's another thing that needs some real defining, I think, or a little more research. And I think as I looked on and got interested a little more in Unitarianism, that that uh, it made way more sense for it to just be the spirit that the Father puts in us. Okay. You know, he just put, he put it in Moses back in Numbers uh, seven, I think it is, beginning with verse 16, if you read that, where, where God's people are giving Moses kind of a bad time, and Moses said, I'm overworked, and I need some help here. And, uh -huh. and God says, okay, I'll take some of the spirit that's in you, and I will put it in these 70 elders, and they will prophesy. And I thought, this is all part of the Father. He he puts some sort of spirit, um, which I guess you could say makes us have some sort of deity in a way that uh -huh. if we have God's spirit in us, we're not deified or divine to the point where on the same level of God or the angels, but there's some in there. And now and he puts it in and he can from that example of moses he can take it out <laughs> so <laughs> so it is it is would you say the divine presence of god his inspiration his power that abides in you as a man i think of it's faith? all of the above okay yep yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think it's, uh, okay. and it should be directing us. It is the comforter. It is uh, all those attributes um, that I believe God puts in us. And each gets a sufficient portion, maybe not the same, but enough. Mm -hmm. And what, what does it mean to be and earnest of our redemption, like this spirit of God, is it reminding us of our calling and giving us hope and inspiring us to continue in the faith? Well, I hope so. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's kind of like my, probably my favorite parts of scripture are, the Sermon on the Mountain, Sermon on the Plain. And I think what God has done there in sending his son and his son to give that to us, it gives us some real practical instructions. Whether we want to follow them or not is up to us. But those are the instructions we're called to follow. And uh, I yes. think that when Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't keep my commandments? That, um, that this is really important, actually. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. not, I think Luther downplayed it a little bit. Uh, I, you'd have to ask him, but he was so wrapped up in grace that he didn't even think the book of James belonged in the Bible. Oh, okay. You know, and and that God's grace is so good that, and I think he looked at these commands by Jesus in the sermons were too difficult, oh. that nobody could keep them. And I don't want to say that he just thought, 
well, just throw up your hands and forget about them. I mean, uh, but I did, I don't know if you read, um, I don't know this, the name of the book is, will the theologians please sit down or something like will that? The real, David Bursault? Yeah, yeah. Will the real heretic please stand Stand up? Is that or, the title? No, no, it's the theologians sit the down. Theologians. Well, that's another one. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's David Brousseau. Um, okay. But it was interesting because he has one little scene in there, which they still have the court records of a man who was being tried in Germany at this time, you know, shortly after the Reformation. Okay. And he was being accused of being uh, an Anabaptist. And uh -huh. the witnesses against him came in and said, this guy swears, he drinks, he he's, uh, carouses, he's a nasty neighbor, everything else. And finally, the guy was terrified of being convicted because at that time, being convicted as a heretic it wasn't good. And the judge said, well, you're definitely not an Anabaptist. <laughs> he said, <laughs> because they wouldn't act like that. So you must be a Lutheran. <laughs> so he was off the hook, huh? Yeah, he was off the hook and he was terrified, you know, that his bad behavior, but it got him, uh, but his accusation was of being an Anabaptist who really had a death warrant on their yeah, yeah. with Lutherans. Okay, so he might have got charged for bad behavior and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Not for good behavior and death, right? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. right. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting. So how do you identify yourself at this point? Well, probably, I would uh, guess probably like you do, a Unitarian Anabaptist, because okay. I'm also non-violent. Okay. Um, I'm one that looks at those instructions. And if Jesus says for you to love your enemies, I cannot and have not been able to put it together how you can make bombs and drop on people and love them at the same time. Right. Amen. It just, uh, it, yes. it just, that sentence doesn't parse. And uh -huh. um, I wasn't always that way. I was, you know, I was raised much more patriotic and, uh, but now I kind of look at patriotism in many senses as a form of idol worship. Okay. Which might seem a little strict, but... I don't think so. <laughs> but I think yeah. when Jesus told us, you know, don't make any oaths, and, and he clarified it by saying, you have heard from old. So it used to be okay. Uh -huh. To make the oaths, you made the oaths, you killed people, you did all that stuff. But then he said, but now we have a, a game change. And the new game change is to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you and do good to those that hate you. And and it actually fits, I think, when, when Jesus was speaking to his disciples and he said, if you lose your life for my sake, you gain it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that that was, uh, that if you want to save your life here and are going to wrap yourself up in it here, you're probably going to lose it eternally. So what, what does eternal life mean to you? What do you expect? Well, I expect Jesus, when the Father tells him to, to mm -hmm. be fully obedient to the Father and come back here and fix the earth, at least to me, like it probably was created for Adam and Eve with God in the presence and without problems. And it may be a long process. Uh, I don't know. It could be instant or it could be a long process. Um, and I think there's theologians on both sides of the fence uh -huh. that say Jesus planted the seed and it's a growing process even now. Um, 
but I, I am one that thinks the meek shall inherit the earth. And if they inherit the earth, that's where we are. Yes. And I was raised, you know, I, I never quite thought that I'd be seeing um, angels with violins and harps. You know, I, I hadn't ever gotten to that stage. But I did um, feel when I was younger that I went somewhere when I died. Okay. You know, I went to heaven. But in a way, I kind of look at it and think, why did I think that way? Because I don't know how many times I've said the Lord's Prayer, and you say it every week in the Lutheran yes. Church. Yes. And, yes. You, and you're asking the Father, thy kingdom come on earth. Yes. As right. it's in heaven. Right, right, <laughs> right. Uh, and you go, gosh, you know, you say it every week, and nobody stood up and said, why do we say this? <laughs> if, if we... Yeah. Don't think that the kingdom's coming here. Right. What's the point of saying this? So when we talk, when you think about a new creation, heaven coming down to earth, that kind of imagery that is being used in Revelation, do you imagine or do you think that that this new creation is something that we are being invited into to be participants of that new creation with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Yes, I think we, we actually received that invitation when we first recognized it. Mm -hmm. That's our, but, we, but there are some requirements, and those are obeying the commandments. We have to repent. Yeah. We have to repent. We need to repent and let the grace to me, I don't know, I've, I've met so many people that the grace to them is three days on a cross. That is the grace to them, given unwanted that Jesus did it. And I'm one more that the grace, and I could be wrong, you know, I mean, but my thought is the grace was, God seeing man's sin and tried to take care of it and give a way out as soon as he was aware of the sin. He went into the garden and said to the serpent and said to Mary, we get the first information on this. There's going to be a fix to this problem. And that grace, man didn't do anything to deserve that. So it, it, falls on into that grace that I'm going to give you a way out of the mess that you have just dug for yourself. So you think and the heart of God was moved immediately to start fixing the problem and bringing man back into that kind of harmony and relationship? I'm, yeah, I mean, I think uh, he made man for his enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And that quickly... I don't think he wanted it ruined. No. And so he said, but the process is what we've had to deal with. There's a process of a promised Messiah. When does it come? Uh, how does it work? And, um, but I don't think God ever really quit. He mentioned, at least in scripture there with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, Gomorrah that uh, you know, he had regrets. And same at the time of the flood, that he had a few regrets that uh, man didn't do better than he, yes. he had. Uh, yes. And that's okay. You know, God can have change of heart and sure. regrets. Sure. Uh, it's his call. So the, the notion that Jesus would become the second Adam, the, or Paul says the last Adam. How does that play into your, your thinking? What, what does it mean that Jesus is this new hum, uh, the first, like this new figure of a new human being? What, what happened here? Well, I think at least the way I see it is the Adam part of it with Jesus being the second Adam mm -hmm. is 
the first Adam came in and did it wrong. Yes. So, um, you know, I mean, we might look at it and say, well, you know, his sin wasn't that big. He, he ate of a piece of fruit and he didn't seem to, uh, think that it was that big a deal. And, and he, uh, he was punished for it and it seemed kind of weird. Everybody's punished before. I mean, the, the good system was broken, but I think that second Adam is that Jesus, because God said, because you sin, you must surely die. That Jesus, unfortunately, we believe didn't sin, but he died. Uh -huh. But the death had no pain to it like it did with Adam. Adam was just dead. Where Jesus, God took care of because he did it right. And <laughs> he's the second Adam because he was essentially put through the same paces, only he did it right. And he did it really, I think, how God had intended Adam to live. Yes. So you see yeah. Jesus, in a sense, uh, or undoing what Adam had done. Yes. Once it was done correctly, it shows that it can be done. And I, I, okay. I wonder if maybe, um, is it the end of Matthew where Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. Okay. Maybe we could have been perfect. Maybe when we're born, we actually have that ability within us if we stay connected. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's about relationship, right? To be yeah. connected in relationship to the God of Jesus. But I don't, I just, you know, people have said, well, you know, it's... Uh, it's our uh, sinful nature and that kind of stuff. And I said, you know, I, just for me, I'm not sure that that really is the nature. I think we, we tend to go that way naturally. Um, we have a lot of temptations, but um, I don't think Jesus would have said, be ye perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect, if it couldn't be done. And Jesus did it, uh, didn't he? And he did it. He did and it, yes. He did it. And he told his disciples, follow me. But I, I kind of, you know, I don't think it's not important to get this right on that um, for salvation. But I do feel like uh, Jesus was laying out that, look, you can do so much better than you're doing. And you need to be like I did. Yes. So he's the, he's the mark of perfection <laughs> that, is, that is set before us. So I wonder what, like this, I, this um, reality of resurrection, that, that God raised Jesus from the dead, this must have been something so spectacular at that time that God would actually raise this man from the dead and give him a new body that would never see corruption again. And that had to be very, very inspiring and very, um, uh, just such a pow powerful statement of what God intends for the rest of humanity, no? Uh, I agree, I mean, that resurrection it's kind of everything because the disciples, when Jesus died, their world fell apart. Mm -hmm. It was when they saw him again yes. that, that all of a sudden they were alive. They were yeah. dead before, just uh, their yes. whole life collapsed in front of them. You know, right. their best friend raised somebody else from death and now he's dead. He's just dead, and they saw him dead. Uh, and to see him alive, uh, and even like Paul, 
who wasn't close to Jesus when Jesus was crucified, still had seen Jesus before. But I mean, uh, that's why to me that I don't have too much trouble with this being the truth because the disciples were given a way out. Look, you know, we won't do to you what, what Jesus did, the government, you know, if you guys just shut up and, and say that somebody stole his body and we'll just call it quits here and let it die on the vine. But uh, they'd seen him. And all of a sudden, whatever life or world they were living in was just turned upside down. <laughs> I mean, yes. it, yeah. it'd be like you going down to a, a funeral home where you were going to see one of your friends and they just were standing next to the casket and said, why oh, I, I was dead. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> would your life be a little different? Yes, it would be. Yes, <laughs> yeah. indeed. And, and especially in the case of Jesus, that he, he would never die again. Not like right. those that he raised from the dead that would in fact die again. This is something very different. Right. Uh, so it, it, it actually is the beginning of new creation in a way. It's completely new. Yes. Yeah. It's so. just not like life as usual. It, yes. Yeah. So do different. you think, do you think the power of the resurrection of Jesus has lost its, its spectacular appeal or it's 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 been diminished to some other you know in place of some other category i know like talk of like incarnation and other things seem to be oftentimes more uh central than the resurrection itself what what have you noticed with this well like, i think you're you're probably right about that that um like for example the christmas is coming on and everyone is going to celebrate the birth of this child because he's an incarnation of God supposedly and it seems it seems to me that if you have an incarnation then the resurrection is really not such a big deal because after all isn't this God incarnate how can you kill God if God did die you wouldn't expect him to stay dead and so forth right right yeah but if Jesus is really a genuine human being, um, that changes things quite a bit. Well, and that's what he was, a regular human. Yes. You know, he certainly had, um, I would say, a little more outpouring of God's spirit on him because he got a full load of it at his baptism. Yes. And... Um, God gives sufficient amount, but he loaded up Jesus at his baptism. And um, consequently, we got to read of things he did that defy what most people do. Sure. He raised people from the dead. He healed people with his words. God gave him that power. Mm -hmm. And, um, but to me, the important thing is not so much that God gave him the power, that he recognized where the power came from. Yes, that's right. You know? That's right. <laughs> he didn't, right, he right. didn't say, look at me, I'm God. Right. You know, right. Uh, he said, I can't do anything uh -huh. that the Father doesn't allow me to do. That's Nothing. very much, yes, yes. Uh, so he was humble. The entire time a servant humble and you know despite the fact i don't do it enough uh that servanthood i think it, it gets forgotten a little bit and um that's that's all he, he came to serve that was it serve his father and serve others so that it glorified the father yes and that does make sense doesn't it Oh, that yeah. in, in God's new creation, that 
human beings are called into service. This is something that will be an eternal occupation, to be serving eternally, and in that there is life. Right, so, and others mm -hmm. are more important than us. Yes. The other person is just more important. Um, and Jesus stressed that, uh, and some of his you know, instructions, I mean, they were tough. It was like the rich man, you know, what must I do to be saved? You know, he says, look, I, I do this and I do this. He says, give it all away <laughs> and, and follow me, give yes. it all. That, uh, I think Jesus is looking for serious followers. You know, it, it's not a, I don't think will be rewarded well for being half in the game. Yeah. Well, those are very... That's just my thought. Yeah, well, it certainly, it certainly makes sense that we should apply our whole heart to service in God's kingdom in order to, to live in the expectation of that coming, that coming kingdom. When Jesus returns that service is going to be required in, in, those, in those days. Oh, I, I agree. And it, mm -hmm. to me, it's actually required now. I just don't do yes. enough of it. Right, right. Now we're, you know? <laughs> we're actually putting into practice what we want to do for eternity. Yeah. And yeah, that's, how right. you would, that's how you would see it. Yeah, I, okay. I think so. You know, that, okay. uh, where those commandments to where Jesus explicitly says, look, it's easy to love your friends, those close to you, your family, but I'm calling you to go out there and love the ones that you hate and they don't like you. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and I, you know, it took me years to realize God's never asked me my opinion. I have opinions and they're probably most of the time wrong, but he never says, you know, that love your enemy thing. What do you think about that? Before we put this into effect. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> he said, does, does it make sense or, or should I change it? Um, but I don't think he. No, he doesn't need to ask he's our He's particularly opinion. interested in our opinion because his opinion yes. is above it. Well, right. His opinion is what it takes to make yeah. new creation, right? That's that's going that's to happen, it. and God is very zealous for His plans. <laughs> yes. So, so it's it's quite a privilege to get the invitation, and uh, a greater privilege to respond to that invitation and to follow Jesus, who is the perfect example and shows us the way to life. And oh. and there's so much, yeah. There's so much to be said about that, and. You know, just Jesus had to die in order to demonstrate his obedience to God and to to usher in life. So that's that's quite a sacrifice. Not and maybe not exactly the kind of sacrifice that that is being described, where God is supposed to take his wrath out on his son. No, I don't think so. But the the sacrifice of Jesus is actually a demonstration of obedience. And, and it's able and where God is actually able to show how he will usher in eternal life for all those who follow in the way of Jesus yeah I I, I agree completely mm -hmm. that um, but I know I look at the world and I know the world doesn't agree with it you know I mean I can see it all of us can see it and and I don't think the callings particularly, easy. And I know, you know, when I first got out of academy and I graduated on a Saturday and on Monday, I was on my way to Vietnam and oh. away. And, you know, when I got there, I, I mean, I didn't think the U.S. particularly belonged in that war, but I, I was supporting my country. That's what you did. Uh -huh. and, uh, but that's what you did because you didn't do Jesus's teaching. That's why you did it. Okay. You know, I had to come to grips with that. And it's like, we're more than happy to pin medals on 
people all the time for taking yes. the life of another created being that God created. Yes. You know, it's sad, but I believe God's going to call us to task on it, on our uh, judgment. You know, it. Um, it's interesting in Matthew, I think it's chapter 25, where uh, beginning with, I forget what verse it is, 19 or something, when it talks about the nations will be pulled in together and Jesus is separating the sheep from the goats. Yes. And, and a couple of things that amazed me was I was raised so much on grace and I go, but you know what's interesting is the sheep, the ones who were put in the good column, and those are actually from nations, that they were told that they were put in there because they took care of the widow and the orphan, because you visited the prisoner, because when somebody was hungry, you fed them. These are all works. They're not grace. Mm -hmm. And the unique thing about it to me is that the people who were saved, they didn't say, I was saved on June 7th, 1968 at a Billy Graham thing. They didn't even know they were saved. Hmm. <laughs> when did we do this? Yeah. You know? <laughs> that, yes. But it became, I guess, a way of life for them to care for the downtrodden, to do the, um, to, to visit the prisoners, to take care of the sick, that they were doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. Yes. You know, they were following the instruction book, those, that Sermon on the Mount, their Sermon on the Plain, and uh, they're rewarded. I, I have a little difficulty because with that, because it talks about all the nations will be brought together. And I'm wondering if that example really applies to your own nation and each nation. As a nation, did you take care of the poor? Did you take care <laughs> of the widows? Versus just individuals, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. Be because it's, it says he brings all the nations together, not just all the people. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that can uh, be what it is. But I, I found it fascinating that the ones who were lost, they really were lost because they didn't understand the whole thing either. You know, and, and Jesus said, look, you know, many will come in my name saying I'm he. They're, they'll be preaching that he's the Messiah. But I think he's looking for people <laughs> that give up everything. And if they don't give up everything, they're aware they should and they're repenting for not for doing it. And, and I'm a believer that that's taken into account. You're mm -hmm. attempting, you're trying. Um, because we might not do it fully uh, successful. But those instructions are, they're not for sissies. I mean, no. they're really tough. Well, your, your desire is to seek God's kingdom first. And, and everything else is added to it. Yes, yes, that's beautiful. Us. It will be fine. And what it will be like, Tom, I don't know. You know, except that you will not have any pain anymore. You will not anguish anymore. So I don't know if you'll have, you'll miss relatives that weren't believers or you're just unaware. I mean, the main thing is you'll have no pain and you'll be with God yes. and with his son and you'll be okay and you'll be 100% content with that. Yes, yes. That's the, that seems to be the imagery that is exposed in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, isn't it? Contentment. Yeah. Yes, contentment, yes. You know, that uh, you're happy with the outcome. Yes. And uh, um, I can't say it's been easy in my life, and um, but that's, I mean, that's probably one of those scriptures I have the most trouble with, you know, my yoke is easy. 
<laughs> and I go, how come it's not so easy for me? Well, it would be much harder without God's help and without oh, the hope, hope of eternal life. So by comparison, it is easy. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. Uh, and indeed. we're, uh, we're yes. both, um, we're fortunate that it's been revealed and we just have to live it out. Um, yes. I mean, that's what I see because I see so much more prosperity gospel and this and that. God wants you to be rich and have, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know where some of this stuff even Originates. gets picked up, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, but keep forgiving. Well, it's been almost an hour that we've been talking, so I think we probably should wrap it up. Are there yes. any closing closing thoughts you have? Well, my closing thoughts would probably be to thank you for what you're doing with all the guests, because you hop out of the out of the safe little box, <laughs> and you get people like uh, Rabbi Toby Singer and others that may think a little bit different than us, but mm -hmm. they're people God made. <laughs> you know, we're just called to, to love and understand and be friends with them. And I'm thankful that you're doing this because there isn't much of this going on. I think there's a lot more deep theology argument stuff flying all over social media. And um, and it, it's interesting because I thought originally you must have been uh, Mennonite or uh, because other than their Trinitarian uh, believer, except for Adam Pastor, which I guess Menno Simons kind of eased out, um, that they, uh, I admire their love for their fellow man. Mm-hmm. It's a simple yes, life. It is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I'll, I'll take that at base value from them okay. and be thankful to God for them. Okay. Well, let's pray that the kingdom may, and that the kingdom may go forward, and that the truth may reach to the ends of the ends of the earth. Sure. Uh, concerning the, the good news that Jesus brought and the redemption that, is expected to come in our faith so and it will come it will come yes <laughs> yes may it come quickly <laughs> come soon come <laughs> yeah. soon lord e jesus even yes. so come lord even. jesus yes. Yeah. yes 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 very well <laughs>